Um, what I'd like to do now is introduce our sponsors, and I want to say thank you to all the sponsors today, uh, starting with Layla Scola. She's the head of marketing, and she's today's moderator. Uh, she's with Ventium Software, and the wind beneath our wings here for today's program. Uh, Layla, what would you like to say about your company? Thank you. So Ventium Software provides websites and portals for HOAs, condos, POAs, uh, in Florida and across the U.S. as well. Um, we've been in the market since 2016. And websites are really, really important for your communication, for your management of your communities, and they help you organize inspections as well. So please do get in touch. And that's Vintim. Thank you, Peg. There you go. You're certainly welcome. And if you didn't know, condos out there with 150 or more units, it's a law requirement statute that you have a website. Uh, they're very affordable and very, very credible. So I recommend uh, Ventium and that's why I use them as a sponsor. Uh, moving down to Rudy Martin, new director of strategic business development for M2E Engineering. Rudy, tell us about the new company. Thank you, Peggy. So M2E Engineering has been in business over 30 years. We are a engineering firm that specializes in milestone inspections, um, reserve studies. We do 558, and we also do some litigation and expert witnesses. So if you have any questions that aren't answered um, from uh, Jane's presentation, please reach out to me, and I'll leave my contact information in the chat, and I'll also follow up with your email. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, now I'd like to introduce a longtime uh, friend of mine in the business, uh, Jamie Gelfan. She's a senior VP at Truist Bank. Jamie, tell us about what's going on at Truist. Good morning, Peggy. Thank you. Um, Truist, if anyone isn't aware, is the end result of the merger between BB&T and SunTrust Bank. I work in the Association Services Division, and we provide lockbox and loans to associations. A lot of associations today are looking for emergency lines of credit for in case of emergency cash flow, in case of hurricane deductibles, we are getting into the height of hurricane season. And we also do loans for any construction authorized in the declaration for the association. I'll also put my information in the chat and I hope you enjoy this great class. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. And followed by Jamie, I want to introduce Cesar Serrano. He's a strategic partner for a guy who can save you money on your budget. Uh, so you can get ready for that hurricane loan. Uh, he's with Schooly Mitchell. And tell us about Schooly. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Cesar Serrano. We are cost reduction experts. We help our clients reduce their operational costs, an average of 28%. We can work with any type of business, nonprofit and facility management entities or building owners management associations. We can help them reduce their operational costs so they can in turn reduce their monthly maintenance fees. Uh, I will leave my information on the chat. Uh, we don't charge for any audit. We work with the client. And if there are no savings, there are no fees. Thank you. Okay, great. So that's a, a new sponsor for me in the last uh, few months. And uh, I hope you guys have Caesar take a look at your budgets and see if they can, he can help you in that way. Uh, next, uh, we had the Paving Lady as a sponsor. Unfortunately, she could not be here today. Uh, she had something come up late yesterday. And uh, I'm going to do a brief introduction. Uh, the Paving Lady is based out of Boynton Beach, Florida, has been around for 30 years. Uh, the new owner took over about five years ago. And uh, they do everything regarding paving. They do milling. Uh, seal coating, and so on. So Don Miller is the representative and uh, very easy to reach. Uh, following this class, I will be sending out a sponsor sheet and you'll have Don's information. So if anybody's looking for a proposal and to get your paving done for your community, uh, they have an excellent reputation and they give great warranties. 
Next, I'd like to introduce another friend of mine and longtime sponsor now, Brown & Brown Insurance, is, has Beth Garcia, also a VP. Beth, tell us what you can do for our group here. Hi, good morning. Beth Garcia Svopa with Brown & Brown Insurance. I'm based out of the Fort Lauderdale office. As you may know, Brown & Brown is one of the largest insurance brokers uh, in the state of Florida. We insure more associations than any other insurance company. Uh, me being a 32 age. 32 year uh, agent, <laughs> lots of experience in the industry. Um, we kind of do things a little differently, especially with all the havoc that's taking place now and the liability and the property side, um, which we'll hear about some of the stuff that's taking place with the uh, upcoming presentation by Jane. Um, you'll see we're kind of doing some things different out of the box, kind of get ahead of uh, coming to the table with a creative option. Uh, for insurance because higher limits are getting more tough to get. Um, liability side, those rates are increasing as well. So instead of waiting till that 90 days before renewal, even if you just renewed, you weren't happy with the renewal, let me take a look at it. There's no cost associated with it. It costs you nothing just for a, a consultation. So I'll put my information in the chat. So if you need to need for me to assist you, please reach out to me. Great, thanks Beth. Uh, yep. Also, uh, my last sponsor is Munion Painting. Uh, Chris Clark is not on the call uh, today for whatever reason. I'm not sure, but well, I am here. Oh, you are. Okay. I, I didn't see you. Chris, tell us about Munion. What's up with Munion today? Hi, Peggy. Well, um, Munion is a, a 71 year old uh, Florida based company. We're, a, we're third generation, still family owned. Um, we, we perform uh, repaintings, uh, waterproofings, uh, concrete repairs, stucco repairs, um, licensed general contractors, licensed painters. Um, so uh, that was some good information you gave earlier, over a million condos in, in Florida. Well, um, some research we've been doing here lately is we found over 17,000 are three story and above as well. So, um, you know, the, this class is really going to hit on a, on a lot of the uh, things that these condos should expect uh, coming up and leading up to 2024. Um, what we would uh, what we would like to do is um, offer maintenance plans where we can come through. Maintenance is going to be a, a real big, uh, really cost saver to make sure you're keeping up with those maintenance uh, items before they get to those uh, threshold inspections and. Um, Again, I'll leave my information in the chat and just, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay, with that, I'm gonna flip it back to Layla. She's our moderator who's gonna do our introduction of our speaker. Thank you, Peggy. So Jane is a attorney and founding partner at Peyton Bolin PL. And she is also a commissioner at um, Oakland Park. And we are really, really excited for her to be talking today about building inspections and non waivable reserves. She's very knowledgeable about, about the topic. And Jay, over to you. Thanks so much. And I uh, appreciate you, Ventium and Peggy, for putting this together. What an incredible list of sponsors. Um, I really hope everybody takes down everyone's information because there's just, it seems like there's everything that you're going to need um, after this presentation. So we are talking about SB4D. Um, this is around building inspections and non-waivable reserves. I think the reality is, as we all know, that this is a response to Surfside. Um, and it's something that's been long overdue and is quite controversial. So there are people who are praising this. There are people who think this is a pretty good start and there are people that think it's a complete overreach. Um, I think it's important that everybody understand uh, the legislature was looking at a lot of different options, and this did not happen during the regular session. What happened was during the special session, which was called for insurance reasons, um, within 48 hours, this was unanimously approved, and now we have SB 40 uh, available for us. So can we go to the next slide really quick? Thank you. Um, I always put this on here. Uh, it's a big fat disclaimer. I'm an attorney. <laughs> so uh, this course is educational in design. It does not create an attorney client relationship. And really important, you need to speak to your attorney before you take any actions. There's a lot of this legislation, as you, you'll see my note there, high likelihood that these laws are going to be amended in the 2023 legislation. I've already gotten a lot 
of discussion both uh, through the Florida Bar and Reptile on what we're going to call a glitch bill uh, to fix some of the areas that are uh, unclear here um, and up for debate. I've also gotten some really incredible feedback from active community members and, and on community boards. So after this presentation, I just say to you, if there's something that doesn't feel right, please email me. Let me know your thoughts. Um, I am working both with through by and through Reptile, um, also uh, as a legislature, my you know being an elected myself, uh, direct. Uh, contact with my own representatives and certainly would be happy to give more feedback and advice. I think it, it really takes a village and we're all going to need to look at this and say, how does it work? Um, for Rudy on the phone with the engineering side, there's a lot here uh, that was just created. <laughs> they just sort of made up new reserve studies, made up new inspections. Um, so I think that there's a lot to say about what actually works practically. And my objective today is for you to understand what the law is and to look at how do you deal with this from a practical point of view. So a little bit of background on me, I was a community association manager before I was an attorney. I owned a management company. I sold that company in 2010. We managed, I think, 26 communities. We were boutique and small. But what does that mean for me is, yeah, thanks for the law. How does this actually work with the board? Um, but you've got to understand the law first, and then you've got to look at the practical implications. So that's my objective. And let's keep going. First slide, please. All right. So this is where we're starting. Uh, we're going to start first about milestone inspections. And so I want to explain to you that these changes are not in 718 or 719. Uh, SB 40 applies to both condominiums and cooperatives. There's some other caveats here as we go on. Um, but this change is actually in uh, section 553.899. It is not in 718 or 719. Moreover, these changes do not apply to single family homes, two family homes, or three family dwellings. So this is not in the purview of HOA. This is condominium and cooperative. And again, there's going to be some additional clarifiers as to where, where they apply. So this is a totally new mechanism created by the legislature called a milestone inspection. So this means a structural inspection of a building, including an inspection of the load bearing walls and the primary structural members and primary structural systems as they relate to Florida statute. And they're done by a licensed architect or engineer authorized to practice in the state and for the purposes of testing to life safety and adequacy to the extent reasonably possible determining the general structural condition of the building as it affects safety of such building, including deterioration of any necessary maintenance, repair, or replacement of the structural component. So, pause. Most of us know about inspections of this nature when we think about reserve studies and having our buildings be, uh, you know, have an engineer come in to say, what is the wear and tear and what does this look like? It's pretty clear as you hear this definition of what a milestone inspection is, is this is what the response was from the legislature and what would have prevented Surfside. If somebody had gone in and looked at the structural condition of the building as it affects the building, including necessary maintenance repair, the structural components. Now, I'm not speaking about Surfside anymore. I, I'm not gonna tell you this is what I think happened, but I think this is pretty obvious that this is what they created. Okay, next slide, please. So this inspection that's now required under 553 is based on height. So it is for buildings three stories or more in height. So a condominium under 718 and a cooperative must have a milestone inspection performed for each building that there is three stories or more in height by December 31st of the year in which the building reaches the age of 30 based on the date that the certificate of occupancy for the building was issued and every 10 years thereafter. I'm going to give you my point of view. Okay, this is not a, I think that this is a good thing for a board, for those listening to say, ah, do we know when the certificate of occupancy was issued? I think this will get tweaked a little bit as we see the 2023 legislation emerge. Um, but I think that baseline of when was your certificate of occupancy is probably going to be used. So I think that's something it, in terms of a checklist out of this presentation, you should find out that information. Next slide. Please. Sorry, slight delay here. There you go. <laughs> it's okay, love. We appreciate you doing it. It makes it a little easier. So 
We now know the milestone inspection is required for a building of three stories or more, and it's also based on location. So if you're within three miles of the coastline and three stories or more, you need this. If the building is three stories in height and is located within three miles, the condo or the H or the cooperative must have this inspection done by December 31st of the year in which the building reaches 25 years of age based on the date it was issued. So there's a change right there, right? From 30 to 25, note, note that. But again, from the date of certificate of occupancy. So you wanna know that. The condominium association of the cooperative must arrange for this inspection to be performed and is responsible for ensuring compliance. So let me pause. The board is made up of volunteers and you are running a not-for-profit business called your condominium or your cooperative. You may have managers and you may delegate your duties to CAMS. I think it's important here just to note that this is not, you are ultimately responsible for ensuring compliance. And so in that regard, you know, just sort of throwing your hands up and saying, well, I couldn't find an engineer, our manager didn't do it. It, it doesn't, it's not gonna work. You, you really have to say, all right, we're responsible for this. And like many things in life, there's what we have to delegate because we don't have the skills to do them totally fine. But what I would say to you out of this presentation is I would start looking to create relationships with architects and engineers, no doubt about it. You are ultimately responsible. And the costs associated with this inspection are the responsibility of the association. There are some folks who have already reached out to me and said this kind of change is uh, problematic in terms of costs, because no doubt about it, this is going to be more expensive than a reserve study. Um, but at the same time, you know, a good board is going to look at this and um, just like Caesar does with, with budgets, like reduction in budgets, to reduce a budget, you probably need to plan for the budget properly. <laughs> so knowing that this is like a hard line that you can't remove is important. So getting a, a good baseline on what the cost of this may be, which is still up in the air. I think, frankly, every engineer firm I've spoken to, architects I've spoken to, they're still trying to figure out how to do this. Um, because again, this is a brand new inspection that they've created. Um, but that being said, you know, go high, budget high, because you have to do this. This is a non-negotiable. Okay, next slide. The milestone inspection is also based on age. So if the certificate of occupancy was issued before July 1 of 1992, the building's initial milestone inspection must be before, performed before December 31st of 2024. That is a very short timeline. And again, I will tell you, I don't have a crystal ball, but I think that is where we're gonna see some change. Um, in terms of giving more uh, leniency to get this accomplished because uh, all of our uh, architects and engineers are still figuring out how to respond to this. <laughs> so I think they need, are gonna need more time. Um, if the date of issuance for the certificate of occupancy is not available, then the date of issuance of the building's uh, CO shall be the date of occupancy uh, evidence in the record of the local building official. So. Your CO is going to be, when they say local building official, they're talking about if you're in a city or if you're in an un unincorporated area, then the county um, has a building department and they would have uh, the information on that. And that's actually where you'd find it. Okay, great. Next slide, please. So who or what agency enforces this? That's ultimately the question. Um, Upon determining that a building must have a milestone inspection, so as a board, you determine, okay, that's happening. The lo local enforcement agency, which I'm going to say is city or county, again, building departments, must provide written notice of such required inspection to the condo or HOA by certified mail return receipt requested. So I can tell you this, as a former mayor of the city of Oakland Park and a current commissioner, this is something that the city has had to take on, um, really looking at, oh, wow, there's we're, this is more than we had bargained for. Um, so they're looking and they're creating processes to do this and make sure that that uh, notice of inspection is there. And then with that, within 180 days after receiving the written notice, the condor of the cooperative must complete phase one, which I'm about to get into, what are the phases? Um, and that means a licensed engineer or architect who performs, performs phase one, once completes, submits that by email, U.S. Postal Service or commercial delivery to the local enforcement agency. So let, I'm just using the city of Oakland Park as an example. Our building department would now notice all the condominiums and HOAs if they were within three miles, which is a, we're, we're about two miles from the coast. So we, there may be parts that are included. 
Um, and then they will be looking for a receipt from the architect or engineer of the actual report phase one. So let's get into what, what is phase one and phase two. Now that you know what is what applies to milestone inspections, what that looks like, your responsibilities around it. Um, now the question is what what is what is the milestone inspection in reality? So let's go to the next slide, please. Phase one. So it's a two-phase process. If you after phase one is complete, if phase two is not necessary, then this is the hard stop. Um, otherwise, you will have to go on to phase two. So for phase one, a licensed architect or engineer authorized to practice in the state must perform a visual examination of the habitable and non-habitable areas of the building, including major structural components and provide a qualitative assessment of the structural conditions of the building. Very similar to that definition that I gave you of milestone inspection to begin with. Um, I do wanna note here really quickly, one of the areas that there's been a lot of discussion is is it the architect or engineer license in the state, or can it also be someone that is with their licensed firm? And that's something that's not clear yet. Um, I had a very astute community association member send me a list of all the licensed architects and engineers in the state and literally said to me, there's no way that all of these associations are going to have this inspection done just based on who's available. So it's an interesting question. We don't have an answer yet. And again, you know, be sure that you speak to an attorney before you take action and also speak to those engineers and architecture firms to determine if you, they have a licensed engineer that's actually coming out or if it's somebody else from their business that's coming out and then that's under the supervision of a licensed engineer or architect. It's just a strange little space that we're, we're in. Okay, let me go on. If the architect or engineer finds no signs of substantial structural deterioration, to any building component under this visual examination, phase two is not required. This is gonna be a good question. <laughs> uh, substantial structure deterioration, I'm gonna define that for you in the next slide. An architect or engineer who completes a phase one shall prepare and submit the inspection report. And there you'll see at the bottom, I put note, official record to city, county and associations ultimately responsible. So again, this is a space as a board where you're hiring an, a third party to take care of something very important for the association. You wanna be sure, one, that that actually happens. So in your contracts with engineers and architects, there, you know, I would advise that you confirm that you are included, um, not, not one particular person, but perhaps the association CC'd or a copy is sent to them, you know, that you actually see that it, it has been done. Um, I hate to micromanage in any way, but the fiduciary responsibility here is pretty high. And I think you need to make sure that you, again, understand that you are ultimately responsible, even though you have a third party helping you. Also, it is an official record of the association. So once this uh, is created, no doubt it's official record, and I will go on later in the presentation, explain to you how that is provided to residents. Okay, let's go to the second. Uh, the next slide, which actually is uh, defining substantial structural deterioration. So uh, the term means structural distress that negatively affects a building's structural condition and integrity, and it does not include surface imperfections such as cracks, distortions, stacking, deflections, misalignment, signs of leakage, or peeling of finishes, unless unless the licensed engineer or architect performing the phase one or phase two determines that such surface imperfections are a sign of substantial structural deterioration. So this opens a can of worms in many ways. I think everyone who's worked with associations knows you're gonna have residents who are going to point to things like peeling of paint and they're going to claim this is, you know, we have a major structure, major issue. It's a structural deterioration and you may have an architect or engineer disagree with them. Much like everything in an association, you are dealing with human beings <laughs> and these folks, you know, just get prepared to hold the hard line and to actually support your third party experts here because when they make that determination, it's their license on the line as, as much as anything. Um, so people's personal opinions is what I'm saying to you. Um, especially because there's a lot of fear and it's not unwarranted given Surfside, not unwarranted at all, um, but just be ready. And I, I think it's something that a good board would do is actually have that conversation. How are we gonna manage those communications? Because they're almost inevitable. They're just inevitable. 
Um, so ultimately this is saying that your experts make that decision and it is, it's really upon them to do that. Okay, next to the next slide, phase two. So phase two of the inspection must be performed if the substantial, uh, substantial structural deterioration is identified. And it may involve, and this gets a little tricky, destructive or non-destructive testing at the inspector's direction. The inspection may be um, as extensive or limited as necessary to fully assess areas of structural distress in order to confirm that the building is structurally sound and safe for its intended use and to recommend a program for fully assessing and repairing distress and damaged portions of the building. So real quick, um, well, let me, let me finish the slide and then I'll give you my point on this. When determining testing locations, the inspector must give preference to locations that are least disruptive and most easily repairable while still being representative of the structure. And again, once they're done, they have to submit this, this uh, inspection report phase two. So destructive or non-destructive testing, I'm not an engineer, I'm not, not pretending that I, I know much about that, but I do know it from the point of view um, from litigation. And what I have seen, even though they're determining locations that you know give pre preference to being least disruptive, sort of having the association background I've got, you've got to be prepared. If you guys are getting to phase two, there are going to be a lot of questions that come up. What if somebody can't access their unit because of it? What if somebody can't have quite enjoy, enjoyment of their unit, even if it's only for a day? How are we going to handle that? Are we going to send them out to hotels? No, I mean, there's going to be all kinds of questions. So just get prepared, get with your attorneys. Also, I think the best practice is to let the owners know in advance. I, there are going to be owners that don't pay attention. We all know this, right? You got to get, you got to get to them. You got to get on their doors. You got to let them know this is what's happening and what the process will be. This will save a lot of headache in the future. If you can let them know, you know, you're not going to have ingress and egress from your home. We're going to give you a stipend for this amount. This is how this is going to work. And we're repairing it. Um, again, if you, if you wait, uh, sort of just do it and say that you did the proper notice and they just didn't pay attention. I, I just would say to you, I think we all know the more you can get into people's worlds and let them know what's happening, the better this will be. And coming up with that process with your attorney on, you know, what things outside of the repair of the actual testing site will be necessary is key. So I can definitely anticipate there's going to be situations where people are not able to access their homes and or are going to be out of their homes for a day or two and, and maybe a little longer with repair. Okay. Can I interject something? Sure, please. Uh, I would just like to interject that this is an excellent point uh, to have a website uh, set up of some sort or a company like Ventium uh, to help you with communication. This is going to require a lot of communication, notices, uh, part of their software program. And I don't mean to steal your show, Layla, but uh, having been with a lot of the conversations, uh, they don't just email. They will send uh, phone messages. They can also uh, get the management companies alerted that you know some people don't have computers. Some people are out of town, out of state. All these notifications can be handled uh, with a great software company and a great website. I think that's great. Thanks for, for interjecting on that. I think in this day and age, Peggy, right? People communicate 50,000 ways, right? <laughs> Instagram, Facebook, <laughs> TikTok. I mean, I, I don't think you can overdo it when it comes to this. And really all residents should be very interested in making sure that their buildings are habitable and safe. So yeah, really good. Thank you. You're let's welcome. Go yeah, let's go into the next slide. Sure. Okay, so the post milestone inspection requirements. So now we've, again, talked about when they're required to have the milestone inspection, right? Three stories, three, three miles from the coast, the age of the building. We've looked at what it actually means, phase one and phase two. There's been a lot of talks so now it's like what happens once it's done, okay? So we know now that your vendor, the architect or engineer has to submit that to the local official, which is generally the building department for the city or unincorporated county areas. So upon completion of phase one or phase two, the architect or engineer who performed the inspection must submit a sealed copy of the inspection report with a separate summary, at minimum, the material findings and recommendations in the inspection report to the condo association and or cooperative 
and to the build, building official again who has jurisdiction. The inspection report must at minimum meet all of the following criteria. It must bear the seal and signature or electronic signature of the licensed engineer or architect who performed the inspection. Two, indicate the manner and type of inspection forming the basis for the inspection report. Three, identify any substantial structural deterioration within a reasonable professional probability based on the scope of the inspection, describe the extent of such deterioration and identify any recommended repairs for such deterioration. Four, state whether unsafe or dangerous conditions as those terms are defined in the Florida Building Code were observed. Five, recommend any remedial or preventative repair for any items that are damaged but are not substantial structural deterioration. And six, identify and describe any items requiring further inspection. So, I mean, for me, <laughs> as this was being created, I really, you know, I, I'm so, I've heard from, from friends who are engineers and architects. I mean, this is quite a, a heavy lift. Uh, their licenses are on the line. Also, the purpose of having this sealed and signed document is so really people can't make changes. I know it sounds insane, but there have been boards who will say, well, I've got a friend, <laughs> you know, uh, we're gonna we're gonna change those numbers. I don't like that, how that sounds for the reserve study. And it's pretty wild, but I mean, I've, I think we've all seen everything possible at this point, um, but this is a, it's a important requirement afterwards. And something again, the board is ultimately responsible for making sure this is done. You would wanna know what these requirements are and you would wanna be sure that in your contract, as simple as that seems, either the statute is referenced or this is um, really clear and outlined as well. Okay. Ah, and one more note on that, now that I said it. On the contract, be sure that you are identifying the building official that has to be notified in the contract. So much like contracts state where uh, written notices need to be sent, I, I would make sure that that's also included. Okay, thanks, next slide. We have a few questions here. Can I ask them now or would you prefer them at the end? Sure. Yeah, we can ask them now. And I would just, I'm just going to pause on that before you ask me the questions. Um, I just want everybody to know if I don't have an answer, I'm not giving you an answer. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of uh, debate around this. So if I can answer it, I will. Um, and if it's just my opinion at this point, I'm just going to let you know that's my opinion. So, okay, go ahead. All right. Uh, first of all, someone asked if any of this is applicable to co ops and how it works for co ops. Yeah, this is applicable to co-ops. So this is for condominiums and cooperatives, not HOAs. And the, the requirements um, that we talked about in the beginning, you know, three stories in height or higher within three miles of the, um, the coastline and then the age requirement all apply in determining. And what will happen, as I stated, was, you know, your local building department for your city or your unincorporated county area will be contacting you. I mean, that that onus is on them to contact you to let you know about the notice, um, but it does apply to cooperatives. All right, great. And the same person asked that uh, said that their building has completed and is undergoing their 10 year. So how will this affect them? Yeah, so so 10 year, I, I don't know where where they're located. Every county, um, just I, I don't know if you guys remember our last webinar, but we talked about uh, you know how the building inspections work. There's a 40 year in, in Miami Dade, now there's a 30 year in Broward County. Um, it is not mutually ex exclusive, so you still need to do the milestone inspection if you're responsible. Um, yeah, that's that's my take on it. I haven't seen, of course, there's no clarification on this. <laughs> this is just a law, but my 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 belief is absolutely that's going to be the case. You're going to need to do both. Um, Jenny me. also says that um, SB four. So states Jane, that let me. Um, hey Leela, sorry, let me interrupt you. So sure. for our understanding, if somebody is currently going through a 40 year inspection. Yep. They're also going to have to do a milestone inspection. Yes, exactly. The good news is, the good news is, is that most of the information has already been gathered. Yep. So it should be a lot less expensive, but that formal quote milestone inspection still has yep. to be done, even if you did your 40 year inspection Correct. last year or it's currently going on. Thank you, Rudy, for super clarifying that. Let me just make sure everybody understands the the 40 year inspection, Miami Dade counties, Broward counties, any county that comes up with a building inspection period like that is the counties. This is state law. So uh, the milestone inspection is still going to need to be done. And the milestone inspection is a new creation. Um, so to Rudy's point, if you're already in the process, 
there may be a lot of cost savings there that which will be great um but i, I again you you're going to need to do it it's it's absolutely not mutually exclusive so you must do it all right great someone also asked um about the three stories three miles from the beach rule she wanted to know if is it if it's three miles and three stories and three miles or three stories or three miles because they are two stories yeah, and three, three miles. stories or more in height <laughs> and is located it's an and okay, and is located okay great thank good you good question <laughs> it's good to be sure um philip also says that they're having cities already request the report but engineers don't seem to know what to include how does he address that with the city yeah so that is our, that's the the absolute unknown here um Again, milestone inspection is something that the state legislator created. And I don't mean to be snarky about that, but that's politicians creating something inside of a professional industry that didn't exist before, okay? So what I would do, and I know sometimes it being <laughs> working for a city right now, what I would do is I would contact your elected official, uh, your commissioner in that city, and I would say, we're XYZ Condominium Association. We've received this notice, which we appreciate, as you know, um, this is a new creation, and we're looking for architects and engineers to do this work, uh, but there's a lot of confusion as to what it is, and so we just, we need some support through the city, because the cities are going to need, it's interesting because both cities and counties as a local enforcement agency, um, to some extent they were, they were in part of this process, I was actually on the Broward County condo uh, board that was created by Mayor Geller, but those were all recommendations. So now that the law has been passed, there hasn't, as far as I know, been any real cooperation with how did the cities deal with, and every city and county is gonna do it differently. So I think just being clear, I would go to your elected official and just say, this is an unclear area of the law. It's a new creation. Um, we wanna work with the building department, but we are gonna need some support and they're gonna need to give us some more support on what this looks like. So that's what I would do. I, I mean, I think it's a, the best way is, is to go to your electeds on this. Now, mm -hmm. side note, elected officials do not direct their staff. So they, they, unless you are in a strong mayor city, which is the only one in Broward is plantation, they don't direct their staff, but they can let the city manager's office know this is an area we're going to need to look at because our constituents that, that are in X, Y, and Z buildings are now having this requirement. We're required to give them a no, notice and, and how are we going to deal with this when they don't have the inspection done 180 days because they can't find uh, an engineer or architect to do it or the engineer or architect is unsure of it. So what is our part in it? So that's my number one advice. Go to your elected officials. I love that, great. So I'm just gonna ask five more questions here. <laughs> just five more, okay. Just five. We have a lot more than five. So I'm checking five. <laughs> so Pete has asked if, um, is the inspe inspection engineer also required to send his phase one report to associations? And um, yes. what is your recommendation of how much of a phase two report should be shared with owners? Yeah, so this is all the unknown. Um, phase one does need to be sent to the association. My, you know, there, again, there's no legal, uh, precedent here, but I'm going to tell you, I believe it's going to be considered an official record. Uh, the phase two report, the sealed copy is a full report. Um, oh, that's going to be real tricky. How much to let owners know about, we're going to have to look at once we look at the what these reports even look like. I mean, I, for me, this is all theoretical. I've never even seen one, right? So um, I'm not sure. I, I don't know if it's going to make sense that phase two is sealed. It's got a lot of recommendations. Um, Probably this is what we're going to see get handled in the glitch bill because they got to be more specific. I think inside of both 719 and 718, everything is highly transparent. I think that is, if you look at the legislative intent behind this, it would be to make sure owners understand the uh, what's happening in their buildings and they're actually pushed to take make changes. So my sense is we're probably going to need to disclose it all. But again, I'm, I'm not going to know until we know. So I apologize. I don't have a really good answer for that. All right. And then Marvin is also asked, how can he determine whether they're three miles from the coast? Should I get a little ruler? <laughs> yeah, right. Is it as the crows fly or not? I think that's an awesome question. I've not been asked that before. Um, so one, it, the local agency is going to have to make that determination. 
Um, I believe they may have to just do sort of a, an analysis. The city is gonna need to look at the, prop, at the boundaries of the coastline. And I'm not sure if the coastline is considered where the beach ends or the beach starts. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure yet. I, I really don't have the answer on that. I will, you know what I'll do is I'll talk to my own building officials um, through the city of Oakland Park and ask them how they're gonna do that. Um, and I'm happy to do a follow-up like we did on our last, last webinar. Okay. That would be great. So I'll post your email in the chat so he can get in touch with you. Yeah, no, there's a question though where that boundary starts. I think that's a- Yeah, because someone else has asked like what their coastline is. So I'm assuming right. you're not gonna know, I so. That's right. We, I, for just sake of time, um, I yes. know there's lots of questions I, I have. There are. Yes, so everyone is asking me, we're going to share the recording, yes, and they want yes. to know if we're going to share the slides. Can I go yes. ahead and do that? So yes. yes, everyone, you will get them. Go for Absolutely. it, Jane. Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, so let's go to the next <laughs> slide, city and county enfor enforcement. Um, all right, great. So local enforcement agency may prescribe timelines and penalties with respect to compliance with the milestone inspection. Boom, this is exactly what I was saying about getting with your elected officials, because you wanna make sure that there's some uh, real cooperation between uh, the building department and your what the condo is required to do with everything that we've just talked about being so unknown. The Board of County Commissioners may adopt an ordinance requiring that the condo or the cooperative schedule or commence repairs for substantial structural deterioration within a specified time frame. So this is if you've gone through phase two and there's some major repairs to be done. And after the local enforcement agency receives the face report. So such repairs must be commenced within a, a year of having that report. Um, I think that's gonna get tweaked too, because I don't know that they can actually make the decision that it's only that you need a year to do it. It may become more important than that. And I think again, if it's a major violation of the building code, they, they may deal with it a little differently. Finally, if an this is super important. Finally, if an association fails to submit proofs to the local enforcement agency that repairs have been scheduled or commenced for substantial de structural deterioration identified in phase two, uh, within the required time frame that you're going to talk to your elected officials about, the local enforcement agency must review and determine if the building is unsafe for human occupancy. So that's the, you know, getting tagged and um, the horror stories that hit the Sun Sentinel about condominiums being evacuated and people having to leave. So that's an unsafe structure where they actually shut you down. Okay, next slide, please. So there's an interweave here with the Florida uh, Building Commission. So the Florida Building Commission must review the milestone inspection requirements and recommendations, if any, to the legislature to ensure that inspections are sufficient to determine structural integrity of a building. So you may be wondering, what? How come they weren't involved prior? It's a good question. That's where I'm going to leave you. It is a good question. The commission must provide a written report of any recommendations to the governor, uh, the president, the Senate, and Speaker of the House before December 31st, 2022. So this is uh, basically the legislation passed. Florida Building Commission is going to take a good look at it. They're going to need to get with the architects and the engineers now that there's a new inspection created. The milestone inspection is completely new and determine if, if what has been passed in you know, SB 40 is actually going to do what it's intended to do. Finally, uh, the Florida Building Commission must consult with the state fire marshal to provide recommendations to the legislature for the adoption of comprehensive structural and life safety standards for maintaining and inspecting all of the buildings and structures in the state that are three stories or more in height. And they have to give that before next year, which is December 2023. So, you know, like many things in life, this is a work in progress. I, again, I will uh, reiterate before you guys. <clears throat> action, speak with your attorneys. My opinion may be different than their opinion. And until we have actual case law that tells us otherwise, or uh, clarification of the statute or rules by the division, um, we are we are literally giving our interpretive opinion of, of this statute at this point. Okay, next slide, please. So what does the board do upon uh, completion of the milestone inspection? So once that is done, the association must distribute a copy of the inspector prepared summary of the inspection report to each unit owner, regardless of the findings or recommendations in the report. So this becomes an official record and it must be sent by US mail or personal delivery with electronic submission to unit owners who previously consented to receive it, which means if you, you know, have actually passed in your bylaws, you will have email notice. Um, you must post a copy of the summary in a conspicuous place 
and publish the full report and inspect your prepared summary on the association's website if you're required to have a website. If you're not required to have a website, which many three-story buildings will not be 150 units, I'm going to tell you this is still an official record of the association, which means somebody can have it. I think here they're talking about the summary of the inspection report and the full report being filed. So that question that we had before, this is a clarifier. Um, but again, I don't know what the summary of the inspection report looks like. Uh, these are all just being created. So I think we're going to see more, more clarification in this area. All right, let's move on to the next slide, please. Who is responsible for paying for the milestone inspection report? Well, I said this in the very beginning. If associations require to have it, they must arrange for it to be performed, and they're responsible to pay for it. Period. End of story. Associations are responsible for this. Um, and I will tell you, having been on the Broward Commission providing recommendations for potential uh, changes to the law, one of the things we talked a lot about was you know, how this impacts people financially. Um, and I, again, I don't think it can really be determined because we, the only bar we had was a reserve study and that is nothing, nothing like a milestone inspection as described. So it'll be interesting to see the impact and, and unfortunate and in many cases, um, it may become very expensive, but again, working through your budget, using someone like Caesar to really look at what must do versus what feels good in a budget. Is what if the association fails to get the milestone inspection done? If the officers or directors of the association willfully and knowingly fail to have a milestone inspection performed, such failure is a breach of their fiduciary duty to the unit owners. So what does that mean? It means it's a pretty simple lawsuit for breach of fiduciary duty, which will impact you as an owner, which will impact everyone if that happens. Um, how do we know if they willfully or knowingly failed to have it done? Well, that is a question of the of the court, a determination of the law and the facts. Um, I will tell you this, there's no way this will not be part of board member certification. Um, so there's you're going to need to know about this. Um, I, I expect in the glitch bill, we'll see board member certification adopted to have this particular portion of the statute because it's outside of 718 included and 719. Um, and I also think the affidavit that is signed in lieu of board certification will probably include the requirement for this. So there will just be no way to get around it. Does the community association manager have a duty to get this done? So the CAM or the CAM firm has a contract with the association that has a building on the association property that's subject to this. They must comply with the requirements of performing such an inspection. So, you know, this is again one of those situations or I reiterate, you are delegating duties to a third party, first to your community association manager or firm, and you still need to be sure that these things actually get completed. So it may be something that's put in the contract. And for my CAMs that are listening, this happens a lot, um, for my CAMs that are listening, if a board absolutely refused to do this or said it's too expensive or we don't like the results of it or we need another, you know, it doesn't make any sense, I'm going to tell you to use the very basic CYA method, which is, you know, you need to put it in writing that you have informed them of this and that you're requiring them to do it. And they, and if they don't comply, you have that to cover yourself, you know, so definitely be sure as CAMs that you are informing them of these changes. Um, and it, on that note, I have seen a lot of emails that are, um, or should I say communications that are a little fear-based and really drive to the pocketbook. Um, I think it's more important to let people know there's been a major change, you know, that it, this is to support billings to be safe. Uh, we have yet to see what's going to happen. However, your board in due diligence is looking at this inside the budget. And, you know, rather than sending me, you wouldn't believe what's gonna happen, our assessments are gonna go up, a special assessment's happening. Um, just be conscious of those communications. Okay. That is the end of milestone inspection. <laughs> so I've got 10 minutes and we're going to talk about what we are calling non waivable reserves, but there are so many caveats to this. So let's go to the next slide. Thank you. So just like the milestone inspection is a new creation by our elected officials in Tallahassee, the structural integrity reserve study is also a new creation by elected officials in Tallahassee. So I, I will just personally tell you, I find this a little frustrating because the reserve study is very clear. The language has been there for a long time. Everyone understands it. Um, I'm really hoping that in the glitch bill, 
uh, we get really clear about whether this replaces that entire section or it does not and how that works. So there's, there's a lot to be said that I, I think this area is going to change. However, I will say this, reserves are critical. And even though you've had the ability to waive them or partially fund them, I think the best practice of any board is to have fully funded reserves because you just cannot know what's going to happen in storm season. You cannot know what's happening on the fact, you know, we live in, we live on limestone. I mean, we don't have a lot of sinkholes here, but let me let you know, Tampa up North for sure. So everybody just, you know, I think reserves are a good practice and I think you should fully fund them. That's my personal point of view. Um, and, and on that note, let me tell you what this statute does. Okay. So structural integrity reserve study means a study of reserve funds required for future major repairs and replacement of common areas, which really should be common elements based on a visual inspection of the common areas applicable to the condominiums cooperatives, three stories or higher. This is where it gets a little convoluted because everyone's wondering, well, what if you're less than that? I'm gonna tell you at this point, if you're a condo, you should still follow that. That's what we're telling our clients. For all condominium cooperative buildings, three stories or higher, regardless of date of certificate of occupancy. So looking at that, you need to have the study done. It looks like many engineers and architects are putting these together. An association must have this completed at least every 10 years after the condominium's creation for each building on the condominium property that is three stories or higher in height and includes at minimum a study of the following items related to structural integrity and safety of the building. So those items, next slide, that are required are the following. A roof, load bearing walls or primary structural members, floor, foundation, fireproofing and protection systems, plumbing, electrical systems, waterproofing and exterior painting, windows, and any other item that is deferred maintenance or expense that would cost more than $10,000 and the failure to, to replace them would negatively affect the other items on this list. So this is distinct from reserves as we know them. So in the world of just general reserves, we talk about painting, paving, roofing, and anything that costs more than $10,000 requires a reserve study. This is much more extensive, right? So this structural integrity reserve study is like the ongoing maintenance from the milestone inspection is, is really, I think, the uh, legislative intent here. Um, again, there's a lot of questions as to whether uh, units with less than three or associations with less than three stories can still use the partial, use the original uh, reserve that I just described, painting, paving, roofing, anything more than 10,000 and whether they can partially fund it or waive it. Um, this, this study is required. All right, next slide, please. The structural, inter structural integrity reserve study may be performed by any person qualified to perform such study. However, the visual inspection portion of the structural in reserve study must be performed by an engineer licensed under 471 or, or architect licensed under 481. As further set out in this legislation, um, at a minimum, structural inter integrity reserve study must identify common areas which really should be common elements. Um, I think that's going to change that wording. Um, being visually inspected, state the estimated remaining useful life and the estimated replacement cost or deferred maintenance expense of the common areas being visually inspected and provide a recommended annual reserve amount that achieves the estimated replacement cost or deferred maintenance expense of each common area being visually inspected by the end of the estimated remaining useful life of each common area. Essentially, that is a reserve study as you know it now. Um, you know that the elements have changed, but that is very similar. And I would remind you that in Administrative Code 61B, they actually lay out this formula of um, estimated replacement costs versus uh, maintenance of the, of the item. Okay, last part. The amount to be reserved for an item is determined by the association's most recent uh, study. And if the amount, which must be completed, that's important, must be completed by December 31st, 2024. So there's a lot of scrambling going on here, especially with reserve study companies. And if the amount to be reserved for an item is not in the association's initial or most recent structural integrity reserve study, or the association has not completed the study, the amount must be computed by using a formula based upon the estimated remaining useful life and the estimated cost and or deferred maintenance cost. And that formula does exist in 61B as well. So it is required by 2024. You need to put it in your budgets and again, start to create those relationships. Next slide, please. If the association fails to complete the study, it is a breach of the 
breach of the officers and directors fiduciary relationship to the unit owners. So again, it gives a very clear legal cause of action if the association fails to do it. Next slide. Okay, so we're right here at the end of time, um, but these are some important things that I wanted you guys to consider. So before, um, on or before January 1st of 2023, condominiums association existing on or before July 2022 must provide the following information to the division in writing by email or US post office or commercial delivery or hand delivery um, at the address provided by the division. So essentially on your list of things to do out of this webinar, you need to send this into the division. One, the number of buildings on the condominium property that are three stories or higher. The reality is they don't know yet. So they are asking you to self-report. Two, the total number of units in all such buildings. Three, the addresses of such buildings. And four, the counties in which such buildings are located. Obviously the division is gonna to need to have this information. Um, a lot of the reason that I think you saw a local enforcement agency is because really the building departments are the closest to the people. Um, then the Division of Condominiums, Timeshares, and Mobile Homes will have this information. Um, much like you pay $4 per unit for, per door, which I hope you do in your budgets, to the division as required by statute. Um, and of course, if there's any changes, I mean, oftentimes there's very few changes, but if you're in a situation uh, where maybe you're still developer controlled and there's additional parcels, you'd need to report that. So disclosure to prospective purchases, um, you need to give them a copy of the phase one or phase two or a statement that is not complete. So I think it's important for boards to understand once you get past these deadlines of 2023, 2024 for uh, the structural integrity reserve study, uh, those are gonna be required to be provided uh, to prospective purchasers. Official records and notice requirements. Um, I think it's really, you know, I've said it several times throughout this. These are all official records of the association. So you need to be very, very clear that those are open, transparent, available, that your secretary knows where they are, that they're, you know, just like Peggy said, if you have a website, whether you're 150 units or not, whether you have a website, you should have it there. Um, planning for milestone inspection report. This is what I would tell you to do. You need to have a board meeting discussion. Even if it's just to make sure that everybody understands that this new legislation has passed, talk with your CAM and or if you're self-managed, look at a timeline, okay? So have the discussion, do we qualify for this? Does this impact us? If so, what is our timeline? And then create hiring directives. So this is really, I mean, this is the best practice for any situation where you're hiring someone to support the association. You should put together and, you know, this is what we're looking for, um, almost like a prospective RFP. You know, we're subject to S, you know, SB4D. We are going to need this initial milestone inspection. Um, what would phase one cost? What would phase two cost? putting in there um, really clear what, what you're looking for. I just don't think there's an engineer or architect that doesn't know about this at this point in the state of Florida, um, but making sure that you have those hiring directors clear and determining um, at that point, you know, getting with your attorney to deal with contracts and such that, you know, allow them to, to give you best practices at that point. Planning for reserves. So again, um, you need to plan. <laughs> Um, and, and notice that those are fully funded reserves under the Structural Integrity Reserve Study. Um, the buildings that are three stories or less, it's still up to interpretation. So go to your actual attorney to determine whether you think you can waive them or not. Um, again, I think that's gonna change and you'll see clarity with 2023 legislation. Get your hiring plan for engineers or architects. What I really mean by that is figure out who they are and start building relationships. Um, you know, Just like in construction in the state of Florida, you know, we have, it's, it's hard to find folks. Well, people work for people who are great and it's important to have a relationship, not to be demanding uh, and to be clear uh, because they, people can choose to work with you or not work with you. And if your association's stuck, well, then I would say, look at who is having those conversations with the, with the vendors. And I think every one of the sponsors on this call probably know what I'm saying. Uh, we all choose who we work with. And it's important that you have a fundamental understanding, but you also are, you know, creating a workable relationship with your vendor. And finally, um, follow legislation for glitch and cleanup bills. I cannot um, say this enough. I think you're gonna see a lot of changes to this. Uh, this feels very akin to when, when uh, insurance, forced place insurance, I think it was back in like 2012 or 13, uh, when the legislature required that uh, condo owners have their own insurance or where it could be placed. I mean, that, that was in and out in a year. 
Um, I don't think that's the case here. I think this is going to be here to stay, and it's probably a, I fall in the phase of the phase of praise. You know, good start to this is too much. Um, to this is a good start, uh, but it does feel very rushed. And I think architects and engineers have to have a lot more say as to what what's being done here. And I'm glad the Florida Building Commission is part of this, and that they have to give a response. But really, this is like saying this is a whole new area for their practice. All right, so it's 11.01. Um, that was a lot of information. Um, I'm gonna encourage you, I'm gonna send you the slides. And um, if you have any questions for me, let me know. But, you know, and if you think of things that you think would be practical, I'd love to hear them. Um, for me, it's always about how do you master the business to your association? How do you make sure you can actually take this, this changes and, and make it practical to your association? And how do you actually deal with it? Um, is always what I'm thinking about. So, all right, folks, thank you so much. And, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, on the next slide is my information. Um, and I'll drop it also into the chat. And you are welcome to reach out to me. I'm happy to speak with anyone. Um, but again, you know, speak with your attorneys. Everyone's got different opinions. And on the very last slide, I just want to thank our sponsors again um, for putting this on. This is not a CLE. We're doing this because we care about you, your association, your boards, the unit owners, um, you know, we all live in this community together. So thank you so much to our sponsors and all the attendees. And we look forward to seeing you for our next webinar. Thanks. Okay. I do have a couple of things I just like to say because I'm getting a lot of phone calls with the licenses being renewed on September 30th of this year for the CAMS. Mm -hmm. uh, the upcoming classes that I have, if you're short on credits, is July 27th which is next week, I have a finance, two finance and insurance credits, and they also could be electives. I also have August 17th, I have one finance and insurance class coming on board, which could also be an elective. Number three is August 31st, I have one HR credit coming on board, which could also be an elective. So uh, the last thing I just wanna say, and I'm gonna keep saying it is, please, once again, if you see something, say something truth. Thank, Thank you, you, Jane. Excellent. Awesome information. Thanks. Thank you so okay. much, right, Jane. Guys. Thank you everyone for coming. We will send you the slides. You'll get them to the email that you signed up with. It will also be on Vintium Software's YouTube. Please email Jane uh, if you have any specific questions. I'm sorry we didn't manage to get to your questions. We had a lot today, um, so I'm sorry about that, but thank you so much for participating, and we'll send you the slides and recording. Bye, everyone. Okay, bye, everyone. Thank you.